If for the prize we have striven, after our labors are o'er, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there, he is the light, oft in the storm, lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee, beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea, the crystal sea. Yes, a sweet rest is remaining for the true children of God, where there will be no complaining, never a chastening rod. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there, he is the light, oft in the storm, only are we, sighing for home, longing for thee, beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea, the crystal sea. Soon the bright homeland adorning, we shall behold the glad dawn. Lean on the Lord till the morning, trust till the night has gone. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam. Free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there, he is the light. Oft in the storm, lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home of the ransom beside the crystal sea, the crystal sea. On behalf of Brother Stanley and again myself, we welcome you. Uh, we're glad that you're here to this lesson, Christ Way Bible Institute. Uh, lesson number five in our advanced class, 201. And today we're going to be talking on the subject of Father Abraham. Father Abraham, who became the father of nations, and uh, we're going to see how that continues even to grow unto this day. One chart that I just want to put up here as we uh, think about Father Abraham and his uh, lifespan, we've been talking everywhere from the beginning and Adam and Eve all the way up to the flood, and now we're looking at the subject matter of Abraham. And you can see the words of our Lord uh, that we looked at in Genesis 6, that his spirit would not always strive with men. And we can see that after the flood, the lifespans of the patriarchs begin to shorten uh, they shortened down to about 120 years. And then as Moses tells us in the 90th Psalm, today we're pretty much at three score and 10, which is 70 years, perhaps four score. But as we look, we see uh, in the list on the left-hand side, uh, the descendants, the lineage starting with Abraham, Seth, uh, Enos, Canaan, Mahal, Jared, uh, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and then Noah. And from Noah, uh, he had three sons, and the one that we are interested in today is Shem. And as we said before, Shem is the father of the Semitic people or the Shemitic people. Today we generally refer to them as Semitic, but uh, again, we're looking at the people of the Middle East, our Faxad, uh, Selah, and then we come to a man called Eber uh, in that lineage. 
It is believed that this man gives us a name that we're quite familiar with today. I think all of us have heard the term Hebrew or Hebrews. Uh, and as we look at this name, Eber, uh, the descendants of Eber were Ebers and came to be called Hebrews in the course of time. We have Peleg, uh, Ru, Sherug, Nahor, and Terah, who was the father of Abraham. And then we have Abraham himself, who we're going to be looking at uh, today. And so we see that Shem lived to be uh, about 600 years old. And by the time we get down to the lifespan of Abraham, we're about a third of that. Abraham lived 170 years. Five years. That still is a considerable amount of time, seeing that for most today, 75 is a, a great age. But I just put this chart up, and these charts are available at various places on the internet. But this is one of the lifespans of the patriarchs, including and up to uh, Abraham. We're also looking at approximate times that they lived, and this would have been somewhere uh, around 2008 to 2183, somewhere around there, B.C., uh, before Christ, that these individuals, uh, especially Abraham and his descendants, this is one of the places that we're going to uh, start today, and we see that lineage down and the time frame once again uh, on this chart uh, and, and the shortening of their lifespans. In our uh, text in Genesis, the 12th chapter, beginning in verse 1 and 2, we're told, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. This is the start of God's calling out a particular people unto himself. Abraham uh, is generally thought of as starting in Ur of the Chaldeans, which would make Abraham a Babylonian by nationality. And God uh, chose Abraham for various reasons. <coughs> Excuse me. But he called him to leave his father's house, to separate himself out from the Babylonian people so that God through him might create and make a great nation unto himself. Now, as we look at Abraham and as we look at his life, we find that it's very interesting. Uh, originally, God's plan seemed to be that he was going to take Abraham he was going to move him into what we think of as the promised land, the land of Israel, the holy land, goes by many different terms. But there his descendants would multiply and increase, and he would have for himself a peculiar, a special people. And we're looking primarily at the thought or the idea of Israel. And during this time, Abraham and his descendants were told not to intermarry with the people of the land, but they were to again uh, be descended uh, from a lineage which was Babylonian in nature. 
And as Abraham's seed began to multiply, they were to marry again within that family of people because God was creating a special nation, a special heritage unto himself. And this uh, would be more solidified when the Israelites ultimately uh, come out of Egypt. However, along the way, there were a few what I would call glitches and problems which uh, we're going to look at and discuss today. The idea was that we would have Abraham, we would have Isaac, we would have Jacob, who was Israel, and their descendants. This is the lineage that God planned. Uh, in the book of Genesis chapter 22, we're told that the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, that was willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac, since he was willing to sacrifice his only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of Hamlet, heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. This is an interesting promise, and we'll uh, look at it some more. But even at this time, we see some glitches had already started previous to this. Uh, we have the account of Ishmael, uh, who was born to Abraham through uh, the handmaid, Hagar, of Sarah. This was not part of the original plan of God. And so because God had made the promise, Sarah and Abraham became un, uh, rather impatient in the giving of God's blessing. And so they tried to speed God along by having a child through Hagar. And this is Ishmael. And so we'll be looking at some of that also. Uh, and as we go along. And when Abraham was 90 years old in nine, this is in Genesis 17, the Lord appeared and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect or complete. Abraham had come from Babylon, and the Babylonians were adulterous people. They served and worshipped many false gods. God called Abraham out from among that to make a special people devoted uh, to God. And so we see here in the 17th chapter also of Genesis, God's making his pact with Abraham. It's kind of interesting for us because uh, as we look at these verses, we see that Abraham for us had already lived a full lifetime before God called him to leave his father's house. For most of us, we would think that 75, 80 years was a lifetime. Abraham had lived his lifetime starting in Ur of the Chaldeans and worked his way up through Babylon. And now God is calling him, even at this great age, to a new life, a new existence, and a new purpose. Very little is known about the life of Abraham and what he was involved in prior to God's calling him. What his previous life was is not as important 
as his life was in faithfulness after God called him. In the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, Abraham is one of those individuals who is listed there as operating through faith. <clears throat> those who would be pleasing to God. When we look at the name Abram in the Hebrew, as we've learned uh, in the textbook, it means exalted father. It's interesting that Abram was given that name, but uh, had no children, no uh, descendants. Later on, God changed his name to Abraham, which means a father of a multitude or the father of multitudes. And so we see that this was made possible through the covenant God made with Abraham. So Abraham becomes the father of nations, but Abraham also becomes the father of conflicts. And I want to today make a point of getting us to understand uh, some of the conflicts that exist in the Middle East. The conflicts that we see in the Middle East have many roots, and there is lots of reasons. But I do say this, that if we follow ourselves backwards in time, Time, we find that these conflicts in the Middle East come down to Abraham and his descendants. Again, God had a plan for Abraham, which ultimately was to end with the people of Israel inhabiting the promised land. But along the way, there were a few problems and glitches because even though Abraham was a man of faith, he tried to rush things, as we have said. And because of this, Abraham created a situation for all of these conflicts or a great deal of these conflicts that we see in the Middle East today. And I want to go over this because I want you to understand that the problems in the Middle East uh, didn't start when Israel became a nation in 1947. The roots of these conflicts go back considerably. When God called Abraham uh, to come out of Haran and to come into the land that he would give him, if you look at this land promise that God was offering to Israel, it extended all the way over uh, to the territory of Babylon, Babylonia, the area of Chaldee. Here is Ur, where Abraham originally came from, and this is the great river Euphrates. And so starting at the river Euphrates and coming back to the Mediterranean Sea, up to the area of Syria and down, uh, even into what we know today as the Arabian Peninsula. This is what some have called as the royal grant unto Abraham. This land was uh, originally, as I see it, intended to be given to the children of Israel, who were the children of promise that God was working on. However, again, this land that we see here and we compare to it today, we quickly learn that 
In the midst of all of this are places uh, that include Iraq, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia. When we think of today and Israel today, Israel has just a very small place in what we call, or what has been called, the Royal Grant. So Israel today has only a very small portion. Who has the rest? Well, again, uh, there is the Gaza Strip, uh, the Palestinians, and originally this was Philistia, the Philistines. Now, the Philistines and the Palestinians are not necessarily uh, the same people, but there is that place today. But what about this land that God was granting to Abraham and to his descendants? Uh, let's see how the conflicts evolve. Again, uh, Abraham was said to have came from Ur of the Chaldeans. And in his lifetime, he migrated all the way up to Haran. And it was from there that God called him. And we can follow his journeys down into Egypt and back into various places along his lifetime. But when we start looking at a map of the Middle East, we again see things, Arabia, uh, Midian, we see lots of other places, uh, and a lot of other peoples. We see Edom, the Edomites, Moabites, Ammonites in this area, as well as the people of Midian and Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, where did these people come from? And uh, they are descendants of Abraham. And the land, again, was divided. And again, a lot of what was given to Abraham did not come down to just Israel, but ended up being divided against many descendants of Abraham which were not children of the promise, nor were they children of the original covenant that God wished to make with Israel. So let's look again for a few moments about Abraham, the father of multitudes. This chart is God's intention. Abraham through Sarah, having Isaac, marrying Rebekah. Then there would be his son, Jacob, who again would be the father of the tribes of Israel. His name was changed to Israel. Through Leah came Judah and David and ultimately Jesus. And we're going to see today that in that promise that God made, to Abraham, in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. But again, because of various problems, Sarah gave Hagar first Abraham, and he had a son, Ishmael, before Isaac was born. And apparently, after Sarah died, Abraham had a concubine by the name of Keturah. And through her, there were six other sons born to Abraham. So instead of just having the one son, Isaac, and through that lineage and through his seed, the nations of the earth, be blessed, things become a little complicated because Abraham doesn't now have just 
one son. He ends up having at least eight sons. So instead of the one son of promise, he now has eight sons of which the promise and the lands and their lives become intertwined and complicated by. And so this is and begins to be uh, the root of many of the conflicts that we see going on there today. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. And as we said, we have uh, Ishmael and the Ishmaelites uh, that come through the lineage of Hagar and the descendants of Keturah. And we see there uh, Jokshan, uh, Midian, uh, uh, Mid or Median, uh, and some of the other individuals. These individuals, as well as Ishmael and his descendants, uh, have the area that most of us know as the Middle East today. Uh, the area of Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. And so rather than the descendants of Isaac possessing the whole land uh, among one people, it ends up being divided among eight peoples of whom Isaac ends up being just one lineage among many who again look back to Abraham as being their father. In the course of time, uh, Abraham sends Ishmael and the descendants of Keturah away toward the east into the area of uh, Arabia. He gives them gifts, he blesses them, and he sends them away from Isaac because Isaac is the one God intended to work with. Abraham knows there is going to be great conflict among all of these sons. Ishmael is the oldest son and by patriarchal ways, should have been, uh, again, the uh, one who inherited the promises. But rather than inheriting the promises, he become a castaway. And again, later on, these sons born to Abraham were all competing with Isaac for the promised land. Can you see where the roots of these problems are? Isaac is not the eldest son. That's going to cause problems. He is not the only son. That's going to cause problems. And so as we continue on, uh, we see what ultimately becomes the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, descendants of Jacob. These are the ones who were to inherit the land. These are the ones that were going to become Israelites. But what about the others? What about the other descendants of Abraham and his people? Again, conflicts. We have Jacob and Esau. Again, Esau was the oldest, but God's plan was to use Jacob. And he said that the elder would serve the younger, and the blessings came to Jacob. Can you see where conflicts come through Jacob and also Esau? The birthright transferred to Jacob. And now we have another people, uh, the descendants of Esau, 
who become Edom, E-D-O-M. When you're looking at a map of the Middle East and you find the people of Edom, E-D-O-M, you're looking at the descendants of Esau, who was also a descendant of Abraham. In Jesus' time, the people of Esau were called Idumeans. And when you're looking in the area of Edom on a map of the time of Abraham, and you look at a map at the time of Jesus, the area is now called Idumea. The Idumeans are still the descendants of of Esau, and again, people who ultimately are participating in the conflicts of the Middle East. Here again are the families of Arabia. We look at the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, we see the people of uh, the land that inhabited uh, Arabia, these are the descendants of Keturah that we've spoken of. And then we have uh, Ishmael. And Ishmael had uh, these sons. So Ishmael had 12 sons who became princes. And then Keturah's sons also became princes in Saudi Arabia, and all of these people band together in essence and are roots of what today we think of as Arabia. And so many times we see in the scriptures uh, Midianites, Midianites, uh, we see Ishmaelites, we have different names but a lot of these people, again, uh, joined under the term Ishmaelites, uh, but they're, again, uh, cousins, so to speak. So we have cousins who are the Arabian people. These are the ones whom Abraham sent away, the descendants of Ishmael and Keturah, and these people banded together in the tribes uh, that came to be known as Arabians uh, to us today. And so uh, various princes and peoples, and as much as there were 12 tribes of Israel, there were 12 tribes <clears throat> of Ishmael, and they also mixing with the tribes of Keturah intermarrying ultimately became uh, the people of Arabia. And so all of this area here, here we see uh, Median and Media. Uh, we see uh, Jokhtan, uh, uh, which is Arabia. All this area here is populated uh, by the descendants of Ishmael, uh, and uh, the sons of Keturah. They uh, inhabited and took over uh, the Arabian land. Here in this map, we'll see Edom. Edom, as we said, are the descendants of Esau. And so the land was divided up uh, to the north of Arabia. We have the people of Edom or Esau. And then we also see people of Moab and Ammon. And we read of these also as uh, we're studying of Abraham. Moab and Ammon were the two sons of Lot through his daughters after the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so 
Abraham brought with him Lot. And of course, in the process of time, the people and the herdsmen of Lot were in conflict with the uh, herdsmen and people of Abraham. And so they divided up. And in the course of time, uh, these two descendants of Lot, Ammon and Moab, uh, became a people unto themselves. And these people also uh, end up in conflict with the Israelites. And as we uh, read in the Old Testament, we'll read about some of these conflicts between the people of Edom, the people of Moab, the Moabites, the Ammonites. We read about all of these people, and all of these people are descendant uh, and descendants of Abraham. And so he is a father of multitudes. And so as the land begins to populate, it's not just populated with the descendants of Isaac, uh, but rather it is populated more so by the, again, other sons of Abraham, of whom the Israelites have to compete to gain the land of promise, ultimately, which is far less than the royal promise that we have looked at before. And I'm not going to go into a great deal of, of we've, we've looked at that. If you want to look at the sons of Keturah and how all that worked with Ishmael, the Ishmaelites, uh, it is in and of itself a, a good study. But the Arabian desert is, again, uh, handled by the Ishmaelites and the uh, descendants of Keturah. And these individuals created for themselves tribes, which equated in many ways to the same as the tribes and the descendants of Israel in uh, the course of time. And so uh, begins the conflict. And in the course of the 2,000 years before Christ, and now 2,000 years after Christ, there is 4,000 years of history among these descendants of Abraham. And in the course of time, we only read about a few of the reasons why these people came to feel harmed or hurt by one another in various ways and continue to be divided rather than united among the things of God. Abraham ends up becoming not only the father of nations and not only the father of conflicts, but he also becomes the father of three great world religions. Uh, and we, uh, he was a part of the patriarchal period, but again, descending from him are the Israelites and the law of Moses. And through the law of Moses came Christ and Christianity, but also among the descendants of Ishmael and Keturah, uh, he also ends up being the father of Islam uh, and the religion and faith that we see. And of course, uh, we cannot again overlook the fact that as he is the father of nations, that he is the father of conflicts, those conflicts also extend into those three major religions. There continues today to be conflicts among the Jewish people, the Islamic people, 
and Christianity, and that has continued uh, through the 2,000 years. We've seen uh, Christianity and Islam fighting, and there is a history of ill will that continues all the way up to this present hour and present time, which is playing out all throughout the land where the royal promise was originally given. And so all throughout this area, uh, and even extending further, do we find conflicts, uh, again, engaging uh, one another throughout the promised land. So those who are looking for a quick solution to the problems of the Middle East must understand that the problems of the Middle East are not just problems of boundary lines and who has what land, but it goes far deeper than that. It did not happen overnight, and it has developed over these years to find and to think that there is some simple solution that can be uh, accomplished uh, without all of these people turning to God in peace. Uh, without that, there can never be peace. Another aspect of Abraham is the promise. In the book of Genesis 22, we find the promise, the great promise that God made to Abraham when he said, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now, this promise we see manifested as we come into the New Testament. And so we want to spend a little time as we finish up today, not just talking about descendants and conflicts and, and religious hatred and all that we find, but we want to center on the one great promise that through the seed of Abraham, all nations of the earth, not just nations of the Middle East, not just descendants and nations that have came directly from Abraham, but all the world might be blessed. In the book of Acts, the second chapter, as Peter speaks on the day of Pentecost, as they believe, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, we're told that when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now we come to an important part in time. We see that through Abraham, there were three great religions. First, Judaism, or the faith of Israel, the Old Testament law given to them. Then came Christianity, and then later on, about 700 A.D., uh, became and came the rise of Islam. But Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no one, cometh unto the Father but by me. And so again, we see great conflict 
Islam wants us to believe that Muhammad's way is the way. The people of the Old Testament want us to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses and be, in essence, converted if we want to be saved in that way. And, of course, Peter was telling the Jews that they must be baptized into Christ. And ultimately, those baptized into Christ, uh, we're told, become Christians. And so, as he speaks to them, he says, For the promise is unto you. God made the promise to Abraham and his descendants that through his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. I believe that the promise we're looking at here is not the gift of the Holy Ghost, although that is a promise also. But the promise was the promise made to Abraham that through his seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. And so the promise is unto you, that's the Jews, to your children, the descendants, and to all that are afar off, that's the Gentiles or the nations, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And of course, in First Thessalonians, the second chapter, and Second Thessalonians, the uh, the second chapter, we find that God calls us through uh, the gospel, and so the preaching of the gospel is unto all the world. Jesus in the Great Commission said, "Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, to all nations." Uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so the promise, as we see, extends and is given to the Jews first here on the day of Pentecost. But as we go over further into the New Testament, looking at the promise, Notice what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. Through thy seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Paul understands that promise to be the giving of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that is the great promise that through Abraham's seed, which is Christ, we might all be blessed. When we go just a little bit further in Galatians 3, verse 27, it says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There's neither male or female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And we are all one as Christians in Christ. And if we be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That through his seed, Jesus, all nations, all peoples of the earth would be blessed. And so today when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, believing in him, repenting of our sins, confessing that belief. And when we are baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. We, we put on Christ. We are one in Christ, Christians. And we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
In Romans 9, the Apostle Paul in verse 8 says, They which are the children of the flesh are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And so again, today it doesn't matter if you literally descended from Abraham, and it doesn't matter whether you're a descendant of Ishmael or a descendant of Isaac or one of the sons of Keturah. It doesn't matter whether you're a part of any other nation not associated with Abraham, but as Christians, being in Christ, we are Abraham's seed, and we are counted as his people. And so today, the people of Abraham, who are the heirs, the receivers of the promise, are those who are in Christ, and those who are called through uh, Isaac and through his descendant, who is Christ, and Christianity through the preaching and teaching of the gospel. And again, that leaves conflict among many people. The Jews... Again, of, of ill will to the Christians, and many Christians blame the Jews, and Islam, again, is in the midst of all of that. But those who are obedient to the gospel of Christ, these are the inheritors of that great promise made unto Abraham 4,000 years ago, promise made even before the law of Israel, the old law, was made. When John the Baptist was preaching, we're told in Matthew 3, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he warns them, Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. They needed to show a changed life. And notice this interesting statement that he made, that we highlighted, as it applies to the promise, as we've been looking at. He warns the Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, basically all the Jews who were listening, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Again, isn't that fitting in light of what we've been looking at, the promise? God didn't have to look to the stones to raise up people, but in Christ all nations of the earth will be blessed. Both Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female, become one in Christ. Those who have inherited the promise made unto Abraham 4,000 years ago. May we rejoice in that promise. May we unite together in Christ and in the gospel which has been given to all. Again, as we bring the lesson uh, to a close today, there are 20 questions which we will Again, post up on the website uh, covering chapter 5. We encourage you to complete those questions. Hopefully you've already read 
uh, in the textbook and been spending some time studying there. And we need you to get those questions in to the office by Friday. And always it's ChristwayBible at gmail.com. As we prepare to close, let's have a word of prayer. Our most kind of gracious Heavenly Father, we come before that throne of grace. Once again, Father, so thankful for the many blessings that we have in spiritual places in Jesus Christ. We're so thankful, Father, that the promise is not just to the literal descendants of Abraham, but to all of those who will accept the love that you offered through Jesus Christ and the gospel. We're so thankful for the forgiveness of our sins, and we pray, Father, that we might be able to take your gospel into the world, to share it with others, that they might also become children of the promise. Be with us through this week, Father, we pray. Be with the sick, the afflicted, the hurting, the war-torn areas. We pray, Father, that somehow, some way, peace might be found to put an end to these senseless conflicts that, again, amount to nothing eternally. We pray, Father, that you would be with us through this week. Watch over us. Keep us in your care and bring us back at the next appointed time, we pray in Jesus' name and amen. amen. In closing this evening, we wish to thank you again for spending your time in study with us. We hope the lesson has been uplifting and motivational. We encourage you to return again for our next lesson. Until then, may we invite you to visit our website. You will find many study opportunities. Our resource page has links to the Gospel Broadcasting Network, a 24-7 station with many great Christian programs and speakers. In Search of the Lord's Way, with Brother Phil Sanders. We have two links for Bibles and downloadable software. If you are looking to really expand your knowledge, perhaps you might like to try World Video Bible School, a college-level learning site free of charge. So, until next time, may God bless and keep you in His care as we walk together in His truth. And remember as always, the Churches of Christ salute you.